So here it is, it's a logical argument that lies behind the structure of a proof. And one way of reading this argument is to say this, okay, our aim is to be able to conclude that two sets R and S are equal. So here is the logical argument we claim that whenever it is true that R is a subset of S, and also S is a subset of R, well then logically it will follow that R and S are equal <coughs> sets. So just by way of a very brief revision and an early break from me for you, just discuss with your neighbor whether you agree that that's a valid uh, line of argument, and if so, what? <coughs> I don't really understand that notation. The line. line under it? Yeah. It's like less than a No, not the, the, the long the long addition. Whereas it's a, the line above the there. Oh, that line. Yeah, what does it mean? Does it mean that if R equals S, then I finished it the day we were talking about it. took me two days. I think it's like because above it are your propositions and below it are your... Um, and then so they, above it are propositions. So below it are um, conclusions that you can draw from it, I think. Okay, your discussion has naturally yes. died down and therefore perhaps you can do it. So I'll give you a couple of quick ways of seeing why this is reasonable. How could this be wrong? Maybe we would have concluded incorrectly, but what would that mean? Would mean these two sets are not equal after all, and that could only be because one of them contains something that the other one didn't. If they if it was always the case that whatever one contained, the other contained exactly, they would be equal sets. So the only way that could possibly fail is that one of them contains something that the other does not. But the one of them that supposedly contains something like that can't be R, because this first premise says that everything in R <coughs> is in also in S. That's what we would have shown. It can't be S either that supposedly has something extra that R is missing, because the second premise, if we prove that, then we know that everything that's in S is also in R. So indeed, if we can show, and divide and conquer, we can split the proof up into two parts. If we can show, first of all, that everything that belongs to R also belongs to S, and then also the other way around, that everything belongs to S belongs to R, then we may indeed conclude that these are equal sets. All right, so it follows then that if we're going to use this line of argument, we will quite often want to show that one set <coughs> is a subset of another. So how might we do that? Well, there are various different ways, but here's a very commonly used way, slightly different style again. Sometimes people ask me, is uh, a proof using algebra sort of more mathematical than a proof that involves words? No, not necessarily. There are many different styles of proof. The proof is just a convincing argument. So here's a very common way to show that R is a subset of S. Remember what that means. It's saying any element that belongs to R also belongs to S. So one way of doing that is to argue by saying, well, OK, let's have a word play a game. You give me any element X that belongs to R, and I will show you that it must belong to S as well. So we imagine that we have in our hands, as it were, an element x belongs to r, and we think what we know about x, and we reach the conclusion that, oh yes, well look, it will belong to x as well. Okay. So let's see that at work. So we've seen this law before. Okay, This is a bit like um, uh, in the world of logic, this would be one of our extra <coughs> laws. So it says if you take the union of any set with its complement, those two things put together, remember the complement is like the universe with that set shape torn out of it. Well, here we are putting the set back in again. So if we put the two things together, P union, P complement, we once again back, get back the whole universe of sets. Well, that's saying that two sets are equal, P union, P complement on the left-hand side, and the universe on the right-hand side. So we should be able to use the kind of argument I've just shown you. We should be able to split that proof up into two parts. 
First of all, showing that the first set is the subset of the second, and then the other way round. Well, the first way round is rather easy. Rather easy. We hardly need to stop to convince each other. It's saying some set or other is a subset of the universe. Well, that's immediate. Every set is a subset of the universe, so that's easy. What's more tricky, perhaps, is to see it the other way round and notice the way that we proceed. So we're going to do this. Imagine we picked any element, any element you like. Let's call it X. So we've chosen any element X in the universal set. Hmm. That might seem to be a bit of a tricky start. What can we possibly know about such an element? Well, remember, this is a set world counterpart of a sort of excluded middle principle from logic. So that's what we appeal to. One thing we do know about X in relation to this set P is that either X is an element of P or X <coughs> is not an element of P. That much, at least, we know. Okay, but then we can follow through <coughs> each of those two cases. Suppose if X is an element or a member of P, well, then it would follow that X will be um, a member of P union <laughs> anything else, like this, for example. And therefore, X would indeed be a member of P union P complement. And the same would be true if X up here in this or statement, you say, well, yes, but what if X is not an element of P? Well, in that case, we could use a very similar argument. And again, we conclude that X belongs to anything union P complement. So again, X does belong to P union P complement. And so we proved it the other way around as well. And we've got the equality that we want. Sometimes we can take a little bit of a shortcut and this is particularly the case when <coughs> we want to show that a particular set is equal to the empty set. Then, so if we use the full law of the type full <coughs> argument that I showed you a moment ago, we would say, oh, well, we need to prove two things. We need to show that R is a subset of the empty <coughs> set and that the empty set is a subset of R. But no matter what R is, this empty set is a subset of R, is always going to be proved. So there's, there's nothing to be proved there. So all we would need to show is that R is the subset of the empty set. That sounds a bit of a strange thing to show, maybe. What are we saying? If X belongs to R, then X would have to belong to the empty set. That is to say, this test, X belonging to R, must be something that's always false. So what we do, uh, what this leads us to, is the idea of showing that the set is empty, essentially by showing that the membership test for that set is clearly always going to have the value false. So no element will ever satisfy it. Okay, so that's the technique that we see related to the argument I showed you a moment ago in the particular case where you're wanting to show that the set is empty. So once again, let's see that illustrated. And again, this is not a new law but it's a new way of seeing it. So this is the, uh, the mirror of the uh, excluded middle principle I saw you we saw a moment ago. A moment ago, we were looking at the law P union P complement is the universe, whereas now we have P intersection P complement, the common part, the common set of things that belong both to P and to its <coughs> complement. Nothing can do that, so we get the empty set. Okay, so let's see how we show that by looking at the membership test for P intersection P complement and showing that it will always be false. So suppose we're playing the same game as before. Suppose we actually had, in our imagination, an, an element or a member X that somehow belonged to P intersection P complement. <coughs> well, what would we know? Well, by definition of intersection, we know that intersection has a logical <coughs> and underneath it. We know that X belongs to P, and also that X belongs to P complement. That is to say, X does not belong to P. <coughs> so you've got X belongs to P, and X does not belong to P. By the logical excluded middle law, <coughs> you can't have something being both true and false at once. We know that X belongs to P, and X does not belong to P. It is indeed always false. And that was the membership test with P or P intersection P prime. So we conclude that P intersection P prime doesn't have any 
any elements that satisfy this membership test, and all which be full, so this set will be empty, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so you'll get a chance to practice that technique of arguing that two sets are equal by showing that each one is a subset of the other. You get a chance to practice that technique in the problem sheets. So now, having disposed of that little bit of business that, strictly speaking, belonged to yesterday's lecture, the way is clear to proceed to the topic for today's lecture. So just to remind you, the topic for today's lecture proper is this, set sizes and sets of sets. Okay, we're going to begin with a simple definition of an operator that when applied to a set tells us its size, that is to say, how many members or elements it has. Okay, so here we go. We often do. We start with a definition, and an example of that definition is a very simple example. Okay? Now here, once again, we have the <coughs> problem that crops up quite a lot with different notations, depending which textbooks or writers you look at. So I shall use, and I think it's a very common choice, this hash symbol indicate, uh, to remind you that this is uh, something that is a number, particularly those on the other side of the Atlantic. And when you see a hash, it says, here comes a number. This is a number thing that I'm about to give you. Anyway, it's also nice and short to just write down that symbol in front of the set. So this will be our notation. We shall write hash S, meaning the number of elements in the set S. Quite a commonly used notation is this one, the size the modulus of S. You might think, mm, yes, that looks a bit more familiar to me. Why didn't you use that, Colin? And the answer is because we've already got vertical bars occurring when we talk about sets. This is the set of those elements x such that vertical bar this property holds. So uh, I think it's a bit unhelpful to have two lots of vertical bars going on when you're working with the same thing, namely sets. So anyway, uh, this is my choice. Uh, hash s, but don't be astonished if you happen to look in a book and it writes the size of a set like this. So here's a very simple example. Um, Hash empty set, the number of elements in the empty set is zero. And this little set, got one, two, the elements clearly gain a hash of that set is just three. Now, at this point, you might expect that I will tell you, and of course, <coughs> hash, we're building on top of the world of logic. We just reach for the corresponding operator underneath in the world of logic. Hmm. So that would be a bit tricky, wouldn't it? Because we don't have anything in the world of logic that says, how big is this true? How true is it? You know, sort of seven out of ten true? Or is it maybe nine out of ten true? Well, not like that. It's either true or it's false. So we don't seem to have anything we can get hold of that will help us with this idea of the size of a set. But actually, there is something. And it is a, this rule that allows us to uh, <coughs> divide and conquer, to split up the work of thinking about the size of any particular set. So the principle is as follows. If we had any set <coughs> S and any predicate P that might or might not be true of different members of that set, if we want to count the number of elements in S, we can also always do so safely by counting first the set of elements that belong to S and do satisfy the property P, and then quite separately counting the elements in the set of elements X that belong to S and do not satisfy the predicate P. Right? So 